I'm going to take the D up to sell. Um, this is a very important word if you're in the nomadic culture because you really don't have a home. You just wander. But, but where you settle, and once you stop, that's like your home at least until you move again. So when, when it says that, that, the, that the glory cloud settled, it's a way of saying that, that, that the presence of God has decided to reside here. There's a lot of time in the Bible when, when, when the glory cloud settles, it'll say, God says, and I will dwell with you. So when things settle, they t at least in the nomad culture, they dwell. It's like God is saying, I want, to, I want to hang out with you guys. You're my people. I love you. I'm going to dwell with you. And where I, where I stop, where I settle, is where we're going to dwell. And then when I decide with my heavenly umbrella to move, you're all going to move with me. So the Israelites followed the cloud around in the desert for 40 years. Now, over here, this word, I just love this word. And, and, and this is not the name of a hip-hop star. Shakina. <laughs> Um, <laughs> now, here's what happened. Now, now, this is all covering up the, 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 how important it is to be overshadowed. Now, remember this is something particular about Moses. When Moses is overshadowed, there are a lot of things that happen to him. Um, first of all, he's selected by God. Does everybody get to get under that shadow? No! Only Moses. Everybody else, fend for yourselves. Yeah, so in that sense, Moses is, is selected by God to be under his cloud and nobody else gets under it. It's, um, it's kind of separating. Believe me, this is separating. Um, it's mutual, so it's kind of covenantal. And another thing we're going to find out later is that it's also dedicated because of its covenantal nature to be, to be overshadowed by, by someone else is going to be a covenantal relationship. So just the fact that everybody else didn't get to be overshadowed and Moses did, that's a big, big deal for, for the Israelites. Now, when they were wandering around in the desert, what did they all live in? Tents. Tents, Tents. yes, because they wandered. Yeah, that's kind of fun. Now, God wants to live with them. What's God going to live in? A tent. Yeah, he's going to live in the tent just like all the rest of them. Exactly. Now, we're going to take away Mount Sinai. And God said he wanted to dwell with them. Let's see if I, let's see if I got a link to this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here it is. Okay. Um, he says, you shall make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell in your midst. So it's like saying, I am settling, and that's where I'm going to dwell. And, and, and it's related to the word to settle as well, and, and Shekinah. God's saying, I'm going to Shekinah with you. I'm going to settle down with you. And so they had to build him a tent, which is called the meeting tent usually. So I'm just going to say tent, the meeting tent. And the way God dwelled in here, number one, is his cloud overshadows the meeting tent where he's going to dwell. This tent, normally you can call it a tent in English, or you can call it a tabernacle in Latin. And tabernacle, anything that ends as a C-U-L-E or something like that, and Latin means a diminutive, like a mole is a big lump of something. A molecule, a molecule, is a little lump of something. So in this case, the, the word that, that they're using here is taberna, and y'all can guess what word we have like that in English. Tavern. That's what you were going to guess. Yeah. It just means like a house. And a tabernaculum is a little house. And that comes from um, back in, in Roman times when soldiers would, would, would set up little, little huts. Sometimes in the Bible it talks about booths. That's like another English word for a tabernacle. So this, this, this temporary housing was built for God and it was spectacular. And inside it, we can't go into all the details about how wonderful it was, but it's extremely wonderful. And the key to the thing that's really important that's in here is the Ark of the Covenant. And it was made out of the finest wood, and it was plated in gold, and it had these poles with rings that would go through so that it could be picked up and moved, and nobody would ever, ever, ever touch that Ark. And what was inside the Ark was a pot of manna over time, a pot of manna, Moses' staff, or Aaron's staff, excuse me, and the Ten Commandments. Now, these are the most... These are like the most precious bits of God's stuff that the Israelites had a hold of. And they treated that stuff with the greatest respect. It was treated with so much respect, it was so separate that, remember, it killed Isaiah to have presumed to touch it. Now, over, and this is my favorite part of the meeting tent, is over the, over the, the lid of the meeting, the, the lid of the ark was made out of solid gold. It was called the propitiatory or the mercy seat. And that was where God, in some way we don't understand, would come down and dwell. And, and sometimes um, artists, like I'm thinking think about James Tussaud, um, would show it as this kind of this shimmering, swirly presence of, above, the, above the art that the high priest could actually have some physical perception of God actually being that, not just spiritual, but some 
physical manifestation of, of his presence. And it was just this, my goodness, what could be cooler than that? Anyway, over over this area, remember what what guarded what guarded God? What guards God up in heaven? Cherubim. The cherubim, and they have and wings. Okay. And what the Bible tells us is he says at the end, blah 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 blah, make two cherubim of beaten gold and for the two ends of the propitiatory, fastening themselves, fastening them so that one cherub springs direct from each end. The cherubim shall have their wings spread out above. So over here you have like one cherubim, and he's probably kneeling down. She's like how shown. And if his wings are covering over, and there's another one over here, and he's kneeling, and his wings are covering over. So that what's happening is that the two, the two cherubim are overshadowing and thereby protecting the presence of God who that, that hovers there above the propitiatory. Now, what we have here is this terrific hierarchy of overshadowing. First, we have the contents of the ark, God's stuff, that's as precious as it gets. Because remember, at this point, God has no physical presence. Jesus hasn't been made manifest yet. So this stuff is really about its particular, but fabulously fabulous. And first of all, it's being overshadowed by the lid of the propitiatory. And God dwells here, and the lid of the propitiatory is overshadowed by the cherubim's wings spreading out over that. Then that whole composition is overshadowed by the tent itself, and then the tent is overshadowed by the glory cloud. So you have this incredible hierarchy of, of, of overshadowing. The more overshadowed it gets, the more separate, 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 separate. Now, the foot is kind of interesting is that this word is the word for separate in Hebrew, Kadesh. Sometimes you see it spelled like this. Different ways to spell it because I would say it's a different language. Anyway, this doesn't really mean holy. It's what they use when they mean the concept of holy, but only for different contexts. This is what it really is. It just means separate. And this is the important thing is that is that where, where there is increasing separation, there is increasing holiness. And that's that's kind of the theme that even it still persists in the Catholic Church. And, and and this was like the standard for a long time. Now, this same thing happens also if you look at the plan of the meeting tent, is the way it worked was, and this is all laid out in exhaustive detail. In, um, in the Bible. Exactly how big ever God, God gave him instructions. He said, told the Moses, you're going to build a house for me. It may be just a tent because I have to wander with you. You're my people. But it's got to be a tent that's modeled on the pattern of how I live in heaven. So the meeting tent, even though it's a little portable thing, it's based on how God lives in heaven. And this pattern still carries all the way through from the meeting tent into the Catholic Church today, which, which we'll see later. Now, this was the outside of the meeting tent. It was just a, a large curtain. And the public could come in here a certain distance. And this is the formal part. This is the meeting tent that would be God's house. And the way it would work is, back here, was the, the ark, and then there was an angel here with his wings. And an angel, see, even I can't get, get, get out of the habit. Sure. Two chairs with their wings over, overshadowing. And God's presence would, you know, tootle down and hang out right there. And then the high priest would be here. And as part of the whole Levitical sacrifice process to be an altar right here. You could come in about that far and you could offer. A Levitical priest would come around here and take your offering. And then that was as far as you got to go. You could come in that far. And there was a veil here that you couldn't see through. And there was a veil here that you couldn't see through. And what these two things are doing, this is also a hierarchy of separation, but it's a horizontal hierarchy. In other words, if, first of all, if you know all the, all the 12 tribes would be living all arranged out here in a particular permanent arrangement every time they moved, they, the different tribes had their different places to be. But they couldn't, they were separated by just this outer curtain. And they could only come in if they had business to come in. And they could only come in that far. So it's like, that was the first little step was, was the wall. That's horizontal separation. You could come in, but then you had to stop there. That was another level of separation. This level was where there was a, a, a veil, and you couldn't see through that. And there was another veil here, and you couldn't see through that. And the Levitical priest could come in here and tootle around and take care of business. And a whole lot of what was in there is a lot like what's on the altar end of a Catholic church. And then this was the, the real important veil because the high priest only went in here once a year. And I've heard this, I don't know how true it is, is that when the high priest would, would go in there after exhaustive amounts of purification, that they would tie a rope to his ankle in case he died in there so that they could, they could pull him out without going in there because nobody else was pure enough to, 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 to get in front of God. Okay? Now, Your voice got now. This, that, that, that outer part 
was called, the outer part of the sanctuary was called the Kadesh, meaning the separate, meaning the holy. And this part was called the Kadesh Kadesh, the separate, separate. It was as separate as you could get. Nobody but one person. Nobody but, but an Ar the descendant of Aaron could go, could go in there. That's how precious and isolated it was. It was Kadesh Kadesh. Now, this is kind of a, a horizontal expression of overshadowing, except that it's horizontal. But it's that same way. Is that, is that going horizontally, there's a lot of a separation, and going this way, there's a lot of separation. Um, now, let's see where we are. Got to there, got to that, got to that, got to that, got to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ooh, this is going kind of fast. Maybe I will finish tonight. All right, now, we think about how about this overshadowing theme. It really doesn't crop up so much. It really hits its stride in the Psalms. And King David was always asking the Lord to, oh, to please spare him. By the way, I forgot to mention this, is that later, after King David, Solomon builds a temple. And then there's no more meeting tent because there's a temple now. They don't wander. They, they're going to Shekinah. They have settled in that one place in Jerusalem. And... The temple is basically a scaled-up version, much more expensive, much more glamorous, much more complicated, but it still all comes down to the same little relation, relationship here. So that, that whole, the whole level, 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 level of separation was still maintained in, in Solomon's temple. And here's something else to think about, too. And this is the same thing in the Catholic Church. As you go, you start outside, and this is like, this is like sin. The world of sin is out here. And then you begin to move inside, and things get holier and holier and holier and holier until you get to the tabernacle, and that's the holiest place that you can get to in, in, in our lives on earth. That's like the holiest thing that's available. And that whole motion from here to here, as you move closer and closer, that fewer and fewer and fewer people get, get direct access to it. Uh, this is one of the things about the Catholic Church. It's like all oh, this stuff in the Bible is just, just bursting out of the Catholic Church. But I don't know why the church doesn't, doesn't advertise that. Anyway, let's see. It's one of the first little songs we're looking at. This is how, so, this, they sound, these things sound so lovely, don't they? So romantic, so sweet. Overshadowing. It's just like the mama bird with the little babies. It's so adorable. It says this. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. It's so sweet. And here's another one. Let's see. I'm only going to read three. He um, says, how precious is your love, O Lord. We take refuge in the shadow of your wings. And then uh, you, God, God will shelter me with his pinions. That's another word for the things that like swivel. Uh, will, sh will shelter me with pinions, spread wings, that I may take refuge. God's faithfulness is a protecting shield. This all sounds so sweet. But actually, if you look at the, rest, at the whole passage, it's not sweet. It's love, but it's not that... that Goo goo love. It's like hard, powerful, uncompromising love. And and like in the first it says, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings from the violence of the wicked. That's the next line. Ooh, it's not this is like, please Lord, save me with your overshadowing. Um, the other one's uh, about um, let's see, this is number 36. I'm trying I try to minimize the time I have to flip. How precious is your love, O oh God, we take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Um, do not let the foot of the proud overtake me, nor the hand of the wicked disturb me. There make e the evildoers fall, thrust them down, never to rise. <laughs> I just love this stuff. Um, God will shelter you with his pinions, spread his wings that you may take refuge. His faithfulness is a protecting shield. You shall not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that roams the darkness, nor the plague that ravages at noon. A thousand will fall at your side, ten thousand on your right side. Near to you it shall not come. You have the Lord for your refuge. I just love that. Just that, it's that same thing about that, that raw, uncompromising, even if you don't want that much love, this is how much you're going to get if it burns you. Kind of, that's your problem. I was thinking like, like, like uh, purgatory is like this. You know, is that, is that does, does God's burning love hurt the people in heaven? No. It doesn't. They like it. They like to be close, just like the seraphim, just like the cherubs. They're just burning with that suntan of God's raw, primal love. And the thing is, I was envisioning that about purgatory is, 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 the sin, having the sin parts of me are what, are what get burned by God's love. It's like, if you wouldn't love me so much, my sin wouldn't be burning. Well, God says, well, I don't really care because I love you more than you would like me to, and I'm not going to let you be comfortable in your sins. And so the process of purgatory and vision is kind of like 
trying to get closer to God, which is where I want to be, but it only happens as rapidly as I can, as I can get my sin burned away because nothing unclean shall enter heaven. And once I'm clean, it's, it's more an act of, of, of the purification of myself and letting go of sin as it is you know, like God saying, okay, you know, you've kind of served your time. Um, but it, it fits in well with, that, with this big idea I have about how God's love works. Anyway, so that's kind of some stuff about overshadowing. And um, my goodness, we are flying. I love this little story. I, now here's a great story. Oh, well, all, all Bible stories are great. What can I tell you? Um, I need a man. I don't need you yet. You're going to be my man. Get up here. Come on, come on. Don't be shy. Okay, here's my, here's my first little question. Uh, I'm going to drop dead if anybody gets this. Okay. Does anybody, does anybody know who I am? It's okay if you don't. Okay, never mind. All right. Believe it or not, I, I am Elijah. And this is, and this is my mantle. That's Elijah's color. This is yeah. Well, this is us. This is yeah. It could be Joseph's. Could be Joseph's coat, but it's, it's Elijah's mantle, and he likes to go to the beach a lot. Now, right, this person, this person, this young man. Now, this is the thing about about all the prophets. You know what happens to me after about I've been alive for about 80 years or something. You know what happens to me? We, we all die. Okay, now we'll try that again. You know what happens after you've been alive for about 80 years? You die. Yes. Okay. The sixth graders, they get that right away. They can't imagine looking to be 80 anyway. Now. This young man, this young man is Elisha, and I'm getting old, and so I need someone to take over my office, someone to take over my office of prophet to God's chosen people. Now, Elisha is is out in the field, and he is 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 plowing the field with twelve oxen representing the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, I want you to kind of come by me a little bit, watch. Oh, get those hands there. Show me about show me. Okay, okay, just come by gently. That's it. My man, he's manhandling the thing. Man, Elisha is like so cool. And here's what I do. Now, in, in Hebrew, <laughs> in Hebrew, what I have done is I have in, in Hebrew, I didn't I didn't cover him with my coat, cloak. I spread my wing over him. In other words, the, 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 the edges, the, the, the periphery of, of your cloak are your wings. And so I have spread my wing over Elisha. Now, remember the relationship between being overshadowed and the overshadower. All right, the first thing is, Elisha, are you free to reject my, my casting of the cloak on you? Yeah, okay, but do you choose to accept it? Yes. Yes, and I choose to, over, to overshadow him. So now we have a covenantal relationship. Now, it's, in, it's important to notice this is not a spousal relationship. But it is still covenantal. And, and Elisha accepts the mantle, as they say. He accepted the mantle. So I chose to, to, to select him. He chose to accept being selected. And from now on, his life does not belong to him because he's selected, separated, dedicated, and he's, by virtue of those things, made more holy. And later on, I think it's safe for you to sit down now, Elisha. Now, here's a question for you. Whoa, 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 but I'd like, wait. Now, now, Elisha doesn't really get my cloak until I, I float off, I'm taken up to heaven in a whirlwind of a fiery chariot and my mantle falls to the ground, at which point then Elisha picks it up and puts it on himself. But the covenantal moment was now and I just put, him, put it on him when he was plowing. Now, I take it off of him and here's a question. I have removed my mantle from Elisha. Do we still have a covenantal relationship? Yes, yes. yes, we do. Yes, we do. Now, here's the other thing. How do all of y'all know, how do all of you Israelites know that we have a covenantal relationship? Because you saw me, you saw me put my mantle on him. You saw this with your eyes, and you know what it means. So you'd be able to tell all your friends, and guess what I saw today? I was minding my own business, and I saw Elisha go to that, that, that kid Elisha over there at Shmuel's house, you know, and, 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 he, and he spread his wing over him. <gasps> Ooh, Elisha spread his wing over him. And everybody would know exactly what that meant for a particular reason, and we're going to get to that momentarily. Thank you. So remember, the covenantal relationship persists even, even, if, the, even if my cloak is, is taken away. Now, here's another sweetie like that. Um, first of all, remember, this, this, is my, this is my prayer shawl, okay? Now, think of a prayer shawl like this, is that if I want to pray, I put it over my head, I overshadow myself, and I make my own private meeting tent, and I don't want to be interrupted while I'm praying. Thank you. Now, but here's a question. If I were to let anybody under my meeting tent, who might it be? Oh, okay, we're going to find out. All right, let me borrow you. Come on, come on, come on. 
Right, this is my Jewish man. Oh. Come on, come on, I gotta get to the right one. That's it. Oh, there you go. The right one. There we go. Right, here's my Jewish man.